Welcome to the Green Room, where we explore the environmental topics that green up our world. For people who love nature, there are many paths to consider. For instance, one can pursue science, or teaching, or art. Today we have a guest who has accomplished it all of the above. Dr. Sarah Adlerstein is an aquatic ecologist who does research at the School of Natural Resource and Environment at the University of Michigan. She's also a visual artist who takes her inspiration from the natural world and she teaches courses across campus on bridging art and the environment, a topic that we'll be exploring in today's show. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. So tell me, what is an aquatic ecologist? Mm, uh, an aquatic ecologist is somebody who studies the relationship of uh, populations and uh, so distribution of populations and habitat. And I am a marine ecologist to start with, but since I came to the Great Lakes, I'm now a freshwater ecology. And I am an applied ecologist in the sense that all the questions that I ask have some practical application, mm -hmm. uh, either for management, restoration, conservation. So it's not just knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but it's something that can be applied for something practical. So um, you're from Chile yeah. originally, that's right. and probably that's where you got your interest in marine biology because there's so much ocean <laughs> frontage, mm -hmm. the whole entire country. Um, so I'm glad that you are here in Michigan and are enjoying freshwater ecology as well. And how about um, what kind of art do you do? Mm, in terms of uh, media, it's mixed mm -hmm. media, usually uh, oil paintings. I um, use um, mostly masonite, so some hardboard where I um, build the surface and then comes the colors. Um, I um, They're very large. They're very large. Very beautiful. Thank you. I've seen them at the School of Natural Resources and Environment. There's a mm -hmm. show there now. They're really wonderful. And I guess there's a gallery in town that they show. Your yeah, stuff? the Washington Street Gallery, which is actually on Main Street. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, I show my work there regularly. Uh -huh. It's a community-run gallery. It's not a commercial gallery. Uh -huh. And how do you merge the two interests? Do they influence each other? Well, at the beginning, it was kind of two separate worlds. Um, I study biology, and I decided at that time that I was going to do my art on the side, and I was going to develop my own ways of, um, my own techniques and my own ways of processing um, art. And uh, so that's how I kept those things very separately, and in fact, kind of a secret, because when you're a scientist, if you tell that you're an artist, they look at you like she cannot be very serious with her mm -hmm. science, and I didn't want people to make that connection at that point. And I, I didn't see myself the connection. It was just two things that I really wanted to do. I couldn't live without science. I mean, not without science, but with this need of, of investigating. I'm a very curious person. And it was just something that I it was passionate about. And then the art was something that I explored different ways of uh, expressing creativity and painting was for me the one that stuck with my heart but I I did poetry and dance and in fact I wanted to be a dancer when I was a, oh, really? a, a kid and a teenager mm -hmm. but um, painting was the one the one form of creativity that felt that it was kind of an extension of my own soul and body so I kept those two things very separate at the beginning, and little by little, I started thinking that, well, actually, they belong together. Hmm. And it was when I came to the University of Michigan 11 years ago, when I felt that uh, I had the right and there was a need for doing this connection. I heard so much about the university interest in bringing creativity and science together and there were lots of um, courses that could be developed, um, activities that were happening uh, across the university that I thought, okay, I fit right in. This is my opportunity. And I started then actively pursuing 
these two things together and uh, teaching in the art school, for example, and in the residential college courses that will bridge art and science and look at creativity across uh, disciplines and well, it, it has been wonderful. Good, <laughs> good. It, it makes sense that, you know, right brain, left brain, that the two would complement each other and, and hopefully inspire each other. And it's certainly, uh, I, I enjoyed hearing you. I, I went to one of your openings and I, you were speaking about how um, when you sit down to do a painting, you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. And as time goes by, things come through and you realize how your work as a scientist has influenced the subject matter of the particular painting? Yeah, that's right. It's like we are, we have a conversation. The conversation just evolves. Mm -hmm. So for me, going to my space, my space being where the painting is and where my, my feelings are at the same time, it's like a conversation that um, develops very organically. And everything that happens in my life naturally ends up in a painting. Might <laughs> be, could be even that this interview at some point <laughs> ends up in a painting. Okay. Um, so things that are part of my work and are part of my passion, my work it's not something that uh, is just a way of making a living, it's a way of making life, right? Mm -hmm. So I live my work and, uh, and that ends up in my paintings, all the, um, Things that I learn, for example, in, in that uh, show that you're mentioning is work that I have developed while working on Great Lakes um, ecology, and um, that's very reflective in, in, in the way that the pa I see them afterwards, and I can recognize those elements that have been part of the things that I'm studying that are in, in the paintings. Maybe you couldn't, but, mm -hmm. and, and I also, I don't want to force the viewer to see what I see in my paintings because I separate very much the process of doing the, the, the work and the process of interpreting the work and giving it to the viewer so you see something is yours, it's not mine. Mm -hmm. And maybe we see the same thing, but may maybe not. So I want to give that space too. But I know that when I'm working, I am in, in touch with all the feelings and with all the knowledge that I have in my brain and the feelings in my heart, and they all end up in shapes and colors. And um, Well, I hope to show some of your paintings, and you can tell us maybe mm -hmm. how you feel they um, were influenced by your science. Yeah. Um, and a show I saw called Mapping the River, mm -hmm. it was a multimedia uh, collaborative work that you did. Yeah. That definitely shows how you have um, used the work that you do as an um, aquatic ecologist. And we're going to show a clip of that, which is really, really wonderful. Do um, you want to just tell us what this project is, um, how it got yeah. started? Yeah, this was um, part of uh, Arts on Earth initiative that um, I think was like a four or five year initiative at the University of Michigan that was intended to bring the arts in different parts and, and different disciplines to, to uh, produce some interdisciplinary work. And I was very fortunate to work with, I was the only scientist in the group and to, to work with uh, artists from other units. Uh, so Keith Taylor uh, from English and who did poetry uh, Jessica Fogel from uh, the uh, music and dance, and she was the project director and the choreographer for the piece. And then Evan Chambers did music for the piece. There was all work created for this piece that I'm going to explain what uh, it was about. And then um, uh, Doug Esseltine from uh, Arts and Design, graphic designer. And we, uh, we also had a videographer working with us. And the, the only, so we were giving total freedom to do a piece that talked about water. So it, that year was art and the environment. And there were four groups that dealt with the four Greek elements. And we were assigned to do water. And uh, so when we met, I said, well, 
if I, if I can, if I may, what I would like the piece to be is uh, about, uh, it would, I would like to educate through art if, as an experiment, as a different language. And uh, I would like to talk about um, the cycle of water and the connection of culture and water. Uh, we're so we're that show that clip. Yeah. Four and a half minutes. Yeah. Thank you. We'll show that now. Twenty-five years ago, they used to come to the river, and there were so many. It was amazing. The river was full of alive mussels. Mucket. Slipper shell, elk toe, three ridge, cylindrical paper shell, purple warty back, spike, snuff box, wabash pig toe, wavy raid lamp muscle, fat bucket, pocket book, purple heel splitter, creek heel splitter, fluted shell, fragile paper shell, eastern pond muscle, black sand shell, round hickory nut, round pig toe, kidney shell, floater, pimple back, maple leaf, salamander mussel, squaw foot, purple lilliput, dealer toe, per paper pond shell, raid bean, rainbow. The wavy raid lamp mussel, yellow or almost green, needs the small mouth bass to host its young. Females siphon sperm floating randomly in the river, then lure the fish with a fake minnow squirting fertilized eggs into gills. In a month, the juveniles fall off into sand. They try to start again. If you walk along the river, you will see that um, most of these mussels that are dead, the shells, are pretty large. They are from mussels that are old, many of them over 50 years old. They are the grandmothers, and there are no grandkids around. There are no even mothers around. They have been here for a long time and they're dead now because we have polluted the water. We have killed the, lo the last generation and it's pretty obvious that it's not coming back, that we're not gonna have a new generation. And the grandmothers are here to tell us that Twenty-five years ago, they used to come to the river and there were so many, it was amazing. The river was full of alive mussels and now we can't find a single one that is alive. And this is what we have done to the river in 25 years. There's no doubt that we have done it, that we have done this to the mussels. And now when you go there and look, all you see are empty shells. The tragedy is that these dead things represent an environment that is dying. This is just the end of a sad story. It's really what we have done to the river. And so we think that we are destroying their environment, but in reality, we are destroying our environment and everybody's environment. Because we are nature, we are part of nature, we are not separate. And every drop of water that we use in our house is part of the river. The muscles are there to remind you that what you are doing to the river has a price. That's what the muscle is telling you.
So I really appreciated this project because, for one thing, it was really beautiful. I just loved watching it. But also, I never really thought much about mussels. I've seen empty shells and just never, it, it didn't occur to me that this could be a problem. And I think the um, combination of all that media together was very emotional for me to, to watch that. So I, I applaud your efforts at this great project. I thought it was really wonderful. Well, thank you. It was really a group effort, so I, I can't take all the, uh, the credit for it. it. It's a wonderful work of all the collaborators, too. Mm -hmm. And it'll be showing on CTN in its entirety, so if people would like to watch that, they, they can see that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought it was neat that you are able to connect with people about something so seemingly unimportant, quote, unimportant, the muscles. Um, I ran across a quote when I was reading your Echo Magazine article. Um, there was a person who responded at the bottom of the web page, and she said, I'm not somebody who normally reads up on environmental issues, despite the fact that I probably should. Linking an important science-related issue to art helps bridge the divide between different issues, and I love the approach this article takes. It makes me keep reading. Mm -hmm. So I think what your goal is of trying to reach people who normally wouldn't appreciate science or, or nature because you're bringing in these other disciplines, mm -hmm. I think it's really working. Yeah, thank you. Well, I've been feeling more and more as a scientist that it's not totally satisfying just to publish papers that are peer review and go to magazines that only my colleagues will read. But I think that as scientists, we have we have to reach out to the general public. If we want to um, things to get better before they get too bad, I think we need to start communicating to the general public and, and we need to use different languages. I don't think that a straight research um, language is something that people can understand. So you need, I, I feel that as an artist, I can make an I can make a contribution by finding alternative languages. People sometimes don't open their hearts to numbers or to scientific statements, but if you try at a different level, then they will maybe mm -hmm. start listening and start understanding that we all have individual as individuals the power to make changes. Mm -hmm. And those changes are the ones that I think I can motivate if I start talking to the general public through the arts. That's Something the as simple as the title of a painting. For instance, yeah. you have a beautiful painting called Unionids, Threatened and Endangered. Yeah. Am I pronouncing Unionids? Unionids. <laughs> um, what are, well, of course, when I would read a, a title like that, especially because it's a wonderful painting, but also I'm going to say, what is that and why are they threatened and endangered? So mm -hmm. can you answer that? Yeah, right. So th these are this, these uh, freshwater mussels that are distributed in uh, well around the world, but here in the um, in North America, it's where they reach their highest uh, diversity, over 100 species in streams and in lakes, and they're extremely endangered too because they're susceptible to farming and to all the things that we do that we alter the um, habitat and streams. And so they have, and also we have over harvest them. Hmm. Uh, they are, they're being poached to, to be used for uh, freshwater pearls. They use them. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, they found that this is something that uh, makes these freshwater pearls really pretty. Oh. And so it, it's also kind of research that uh, the scientists don't want to publish about um, distributions, for example, because they don't want people to go and keep poaching. So it's hmm. you cannot take uh, these individuals. Many of the species you're you're, you're not allowed to take one home. You, you hmm. They are protected because they're so endangered and threatened, and they are sensitive because they need um, not only they need a clean environment, but they they also need a fish host. So the way that they reproduce is by having a fish that actually carries the um, the larvae upstream in the s in the river. So when you cut rivers with dams and you uh, don't let those fish move around, you also interrupt their life their life cycle. So they're very sensitive to human um, activities. 
I've never heard of that, that there was any um, <laughs> problem with this particular species. I mean, you've heard, uh, is it called charismatic megafauna? Right. People think about like deer, they have these gorgeous faces and everybody's ah, heart, yes. you know, but right. you don't think about mussels as something that you well. care about. But they're part of the ecosystem, right? There's a lot of, of um, course. <laughs> animals that <laughs> depend on them. And if, what would happen yeah. if we didn't have mussels? What would be the... What would happen? I don't know what would happen, but uh, that's not something we want. Uh, they have evolved in, uh, in, in a long, long time, and they're there. And they, every uh, species has its own role. And in, in the rivers, of, um, not only these fresh mu uh, water mussels, but filtrators kind of bring are part of the food chain, so they, they are feeding on phytoplankton and they are transferring the energy to predators. In this case, for example, mammals, so raccoons and all kinds of uh, mammals that um, are around the river will feed on them, as well as some fish species, mm -hmm. and uh, so they're part of the food chain. Mm -hmm. Which we'll never know until these <laughs> things are taken <laughs> out, what the repercussions are. That's right. We don't want to know. Right. <laughs> uh, and you mentioned um, stopping the flow of a river. Um, you have several paintings that address that, um, mm -hmm. like um, Bakker con Vida. H yeah. How do you say that? Yeah. Okay. Bakker con Vida. Yeah, it's can you a baker tell me about that one? With life. Okay. Yes. Uh, I did teach a class. Uh, on sustainability and energy resources in South America, in particular Patagonia, Chilean Patagonia. And in that place, there are these uh, dams that have been proposed for elec um, electric um, energy. And these are rivers that are absolutely pristine, and these dams will just destroy the, the whole ecosystem. Our, so rivers are our, like our veins. When you start putting dams, it's like you cut your veins, hmm. right? And all the nutrients that come from the um, from terrestrial ecosystem go to either the lakes, in this case, for Great Lakes, uh, in, in Chile, Patagonia, to the ocean. When you start putting dams, you cut the flow of nutrients and sediments, and you totally transform not only the river, but what's below the river. And so I'm, I don't want to see that happen. And that uh, painting, the Baker con Riva, Vida, is that um, I, f I fell next to that river like I disappeared, that I wasn't a human being anymore. I was really part of nature, part of those particles in there thinking about, you know, that river has been there forever. And we, in, in a year, want to build a dam, it's going to just totally changed the face of the earth. And I did that painting because I wanted to be with the river for a while. And, uh, and that's, that's what that represents. My fear of, of culture changing the planet in a way that at the end, as part of the planet and as part of nature, we're not going to have a place to live either. You have another painting, uh, which sounds like it might be inspired similarly, called Let My River Flow th Free. Yeah. So that one was because I was working on um, uh, Michigan streams, looking at the, you know what sea lamprey are? They're mm -hmm. invasive species, and, and they, their larvae live in, in Michigan streams, well, around the Great Lakes in general, but I was looking in, in Michigan streams. And as I was... Uh, doing research, I realized how many dams <laughs> are in, in, in Michigan streams. Mm. And pretty much there is no river that doesn't have a dam mm. right? uh, for multiple purposes. But that's what we're doing. We're cutting all these veins. And at the same time, I was doing this teaching. So the two things came together, and that piece represent this fear of fragmentation. Mm. Um, how about River Blue? How did that... Um get inspired? Uh, from the beauty of the, the rivers around Michigan, I, as I said, I came from the marine environment, but I fell in love with rivers. They are, they are so close to us. You know, in the ocean, I didn't get to see much of the creatures. Doing research in the ocean is a little bit more of looking at numbers. When you start working with uh, streams, you go in there, you put your foot and, and you are in your system. 
and, and they're so beautiful and they're so diverse and there's so much to learn and to ask about these rivers that I think that has impregnated my work and the flow, you know, this magic movement of water going somewhere, life, and, and we are in this flow like the river. Right? And, uh, and that, that's what, um, it's in that painting. There's one I called Headwaters that when, uh, in the Mapping the River uh -huh. project, it morphs. Now did that, did you paint the Headwaters after seeing the video? Did you do that on purpose to make it morph? No, that that painting was created Just before coincidentally? the piece. Wow, it, it's beautiful. Because, it's because it's all connected, right? Ah. The, the idea for mapping the river came from the research I was doing. Uh -huh. And and these paintings came from the same origin, so they just met. Huh. Wow, that was really beautiful. It part takes of me it. about six months to do one of those paintings. Ah. So I couldn't have created all those pieces yeah. in the, yeah. um, what was it, like six months maybe overall that we, uh, huh. we spent on the project. Well, it was a very successful yeah. project. So what are your um, plans for future directions? Uh, we, we need to know how do people can find uh, your website one uh -huh. thing. Um, is it, you were telling me um, sarahadlerstein.wordpress.com? Yeah, that's my new website. Uh -huh. I, um, it's, n it's still not 100% done, but I felt that it was time for me to have one. <laughs> People kept asking and I didn't really. Uh, and well, uh, so, yes. Now they know. Now <laughs> they know. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for being here today. It's been really interesting talking with you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for joining us today in the green room.